Let me, let me go back a little bit. I think I, I'm not sure I was clear last time. I suspect I wasn't terribly clear. Uh, but I just thought I would very quickly review and then move on to a couple of other concepts that I think are neat, quite neat, unproved. There's a lot of interesting stuff here, which uh, this chaos, complexity stuff, which is unproved, but seems to make a lot of sense. And, uh, there's good problems here. So I'm, so I'm trying to sell you something. Sell so you some of these problems. Okay, let me just, uh, as a matter of terminology, there was a terminology that Adam and I used in the paper on the second law, uh, just to get the terminology down so that I can use it. We, uh, the systems we're interested in, or we were interested in, k-local systems, uh, which typically are not spatially local, could be, but, um, but since we're kind of interested in an ensemble of different kinds of systems, typically not spatially local. And the systems, the quantum systems that we're talking about, I would just call Q systems, Q for quantum. And they're a collection of qubits with all kinds of all-to-all companies. That's the system where K qubits. K is the number of qubits, which I often sometimes call in. And uh, don't hold me to one, uh, one notation or the other. I'll probably change it. The other, kind, the other system was what Adam and I called the A system. And the A system was just this motion on SU to the N. It's governed by a given motion. It's governed by a particular Hamiltonian. Here's the unit operator with time. Given a Hamiltonian, we move out along some trajectory. Uh, that trajectory or that evolution, the evolution on SU2 to the N, is what we call the auxiliary system. This is a classical system. I could have just called it the classical system. This is the, uh, and it has, if there are n qubits here, this thing has a dimension which is exponential in n, an exponential number of degrees of freedom. The other feature of it is, it is a classical system, meaning to say it has a Hamiltonian, or Lagrangian, thought of as a, uh, an action. Uh, but what corresponds to the initial condition, the initial condition is typically that you start with the identity operator. We're just studying the time evolution operator. So at t equals zero is the identity operator. Okay, but the different Hamiltonians within some within some class that we might study, I could consider all possible Hamiltonians, they correspond to the initial velocity. Given the Hamiltonian that determines the initial velocity away from, uh, uh, from the origin here. And um, so the actual dependence of the classical system on the particular Hamiltonian goes away and it's replaced by the initial condition, the initial, the initial motion. Okay. Just to really quickly review, just to remind you. Uh, the ordinary metric, the bi-invariant metric, left-right invariant metric, is not a suitable or interesting metric for studying uh, the cost, the computational cost of going from one place to another in this geometry. We want something which is more like Nielsen's geometry, which you pay penalties for going in what's called an unnatural directions. And such metrics have the property of being right invariant or left invariant, depending on your uh, conventions, or we call them complexity metrics, or Nielsen metrics, or whatever you want. And the general character, or the general formula for such a metric, uh, this is the most general right invariant metric, the Riemannian metric. That's the form of the omega i. I'll just write it down again, i i j. 
Well, the deal makers are related. What are they? The deal maker, I, is just equal to I times a trace of the U dagger differential motion uh, times a element of the Pauli algebra times U. Where an element of the Pauli algebra can mean any product of uh, basic um, qubit operators. Okay, so that's that's the setup. One main thing that I assumed was that this I sub I J was diagonal, diagonal, um, diagonal, and a function of the weights of the operators sigma I. The weight meaning the number of qubits that goes into it. And um, I suggested that, or I can almost say I proved it based on an assumption, an assumption, that I, let's call it as a function of the weight, goes as, for example, 4 to the weight. The argument here is well, first of all, it was an assumption. The assumption is that the penalty factor that you pay for a complex operator, or a relatively complex operator, only depends on the operator and not on how many qubits they have all together. So you may say that the one and two qubit operators are free for free. They don't cost us anything, no penalty. Three, four, five pay a penalty depending on their weight. And the basic assumption was that uh, that that penalty does not depend on the total number of, um, of qubits. And then one more assumption is that the maximal complexity, the maximal, you can think of it just for the moment, as the maximal distance with this metric on this space is of order 4 to the number of qubits. That's the maximal complexity that you can expect uh, for for k qubits, for the unitary operation for k qubits, and that basically, um, right, so the maximal complexity is for the largest, the largest weight is of order the number of qubits. Okay. So in order to get that the largest uh, complexity is also of order 4 to the k, this is, uh, this is what you expect uh, for the penalty factor. You can, you can try other games. There's probably a zillion definitions of complexity. Some of them are somewhat universal and all similar to each other, uh, differ mainly by numerical factors. Others may be very, very different and they may not be appropriate for our problem. Okay, now I also uh, told you about a calculation that Adam and I did, which was basically the curvature of sections, two-dimensional sections in this geometry, I spoke about it in terms of Loschmidt echoes. Another way to speak about it is to say, supposing I have a Hamiltonian, and I'm interested in the operator e to the minus i h t, some simple operator w, simple operator can mean a one or two qubit operator. E plus IHT, which is things we sometimes call precursors. Uh, how the complexity of these things grow. Uh, so it's either natural or unnatural, I don't know which, but um, here's the picture. The, the E to the IHT generates a trajectory on it. The operator W makes a little shift. <coughs> and then the e to the plus IHT represents the trajectory going in the other direction. This is very similar to the Loschmidt uh, echo operator. The Loschmidt echo operator is, would be, in this case, the same thing, except add W to H up here. And studying the complexity of a unitary time evolution times an almost inverse of it. And what happens is because of chaos, uh, we expect 
that after a suitable long time, longer than the, than the, um, than the scrambling time, the complexity of this operator will start to grow linearly with time. Okay, so that was uh, something we tried to do. But one way of exploring it is to, in, in this complexity space, consider exactly this, a geodesic. These are geodesics because they're generated by K-local Hamiltonians. A little bump due to the W and a geodesic, I guess one goes one way and the other goes the other way. And then, moving a certain amount of time, both along here and along here, construct the geodesics which connect these points. That constructs the surface. Actually, they won't look like this. They will look more like this. So we can construct the surface and then try to study its geometry, the geometry of the surface. And if, for example, we know the curvature of this two-dimensional surface, that will tell us something about how the geodesics grow. It tell us about geodesic deviation. And geodesic deviation has to do with exactly this, how the distances along here grow. So it was an exercise to try to compute the curvature on the surface, which is spanned by two geodesics like that, and that's very hard. At least I think it's, we, we have not been able to do that. What we're able to do is calculate the curvature near the origin over here. Uh, we can calculate the curvature very near the origin over here, and I'll tell you, I'll just remind you what I got. But I want to show you where the factor of 1 over k came from. I told you there was a factor of 1 over k, and I just want to show you where that came from. Using the Baker Hausdorff, uh, somebody else? Campbell. 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 Baker Campbell Hausdorff lemma. You take this object, which is of the form of a e to the i minus i h t, some w, some e to the minus i h t. You expand it out. You get a whole bunch of nested commutators, and you simply start calculating, and uh, you calculate them. The, you calculate whatever it is you want to calculate. Whatever it is you want to calculate. Using the metric, calculate the distance between here and here, and then use it to calculate the curvature. And the curvature that you get, this is the two-dimensional sectional curvature, has a curious form. That's one. Is a number, let's see, the number, yeah, it's one third. Now, this is for two local Hamiltonians. Assuming the Hamiltonian is here, is two local. Actually, it's much more general than that. I'll tell you what the generalization is. But assume the Hamiltonian is two local, and also for simplicity, that the W operator is also two local. Two local can also be one local. Okay, this turns out to be, oh, yeah, if the class of Hamiltonians we're interested in is too local, then we'll start, we, we want to start paying a penalty price at weight three. That's what we're going to start paying a penalty price. So this turns out to be one minus I three over four. This is just numerical calculation. There's nothing here. Uh, if I three is zero, incidentally, or, no, sorry, I3 is 1. If all the i's were just 1, no penalty factor at all, this would be 1 third minus 1 quarter is 1 twelfth. Be a number, but it would be positive. It would be positive, and this curvature would be positive. It's not until you've jacked up the penalty factor a certain amount before the curvature becomes negative. And then there's here a trace. Well, there's a couple of so a trace of commutator H with delta. No, I guess it's what I call it, W or W. And this last time I probably called it delta. H W W H was the square of a commutator. Why do I have one being H W and the other being W H? 
because I wanted to be positive. And Kami Payne is oriented to her mission. Okay. Provided by Trace Delta squared, Trace A squared. This is a formula you get in the end. Okay. Now, imagine you're starting to calculate uh, these, um, these commutators. You have a whole bunch of qubits. As I said, for simplicity, let's take the case where we're interested in two locality. Uh, we can do it for general k locality. The answer is the same, but let's take two locality. Uh, and let's assume both delta and h are two local. So they're both two local Hamiltonians. And how do we calculate trace h squared? Well, each term in h involves a pair of qubits. So there's a term in h, there's a term in h. Now we're going to hit it with another h to make h squared. Well, the trace will only be non-zero if the second term matches the first one. If there's any exposed qubit that hasn't uh, canceled with another one, we we'll get zero. So this one will have to lie on top of this. Oops. And what will trace h squared be proportional to? It will be proportional to the number of qubits. It will be proportional to the number of, um, uh, sorry, the number of pairs of qubits. In other words, it will be proportional to k squared. Same with trace delta squared and h squared. So there's going to be, for example, in this case, a k to the fourth downstairs. Okay. For this thing here, we're taking the commutator of h with w. Okay, so we start with an h, and now we throw in a w someplace. The w, uh, w could be that w there. Um, right. How are we going to get a commutator? We're going to get a commutator only if two of these match. Okay. So that's a constraint. In calculating this thing up here, we get exactly the same kind of thing. This operator has to match this operator, but there's now a constraint that two of the uh, that these two have to match. How, what's the probability if you throw down pairs like this? that two of these will match, that's 1 over k. So that means that this operator, this combination up here, will be down by 1 power of k. In this case, it will only be k cubed. That's what you have to have is something like this. And um, you pick this point independently, this point, and that point independently, and that's k cubed. And so the answer is a order 1 over k. And this is general. I mean, this, doesn't, this does not depend on 2 locality. If we were doing k locality, we would throw down groups of k. But still, the requirement that the commutator be non-zero would always require that there be a pairing of, two, uh, of at least one of them. And that would make it down by 1 power of k. So that's where that 1 over k came from, just in case anybody was interested. Seems to be very general. Right, so just going quickly over things we said last time. All right, now I do not know this to be a fact that the curvature of these surfaces here, for relatively long separation from the origin, stays constant. I don't know that for a fact. I suspect it's true. It's a, it's a problem which I would like to see solved, but let me assume it. Let me assume that this curvature, which has been evaluated over here, is approximately constant throughout, the, uh, throughout some range. Now, it's only necessary that the range be up to the scrambling time. Past the scrambling time, you don't have to worry about it. Things will take care of themselves. All right, that means that this metric of this um, section generated by vertical geodesics here should be a surface of constant curvature, and that would mean it would have a metric which looks like some sort of <coughs> k. I'll tell you what the k is doing here in a minute. B 
dr squared plus sinh squared r d theta squared, where theta just means the angular direction in here, and r means the distance away from the origin. That's what that surface would look like if it were a constant curvature. Okay, everybody happy? All right, now, oh, where did this k come from? This k was a curvature. Um, the, k, <laughs> the k is the inverse curvature. The, this k is the square of the radius of curvature. Uh, no. Now, I, I proposed a principle. I pro proposed the principle. This is partly definition. It's partly uh, assumption that uh, that the um, that the uh, that the complexity tracks the distance along uh, the um, uh, the trajectory. I proposed not that complexity is equal to, let's call it length, meaning geodesic length on, on this surface, but rather action. You can work with either, but this one turns out to be a lot neater. With action, where action means the following. You take this metric and you consider a point particle, non-relativistic point particle, moving on this surface. Okay. So that means, what would that mean? That would mean that the action or the Lagrangian for this motion. Instead of this, we would have r dot squared, and this would be beta dot squared. And I would put a factor of two there, just because it's normal to put a factor of two into a Lagrangian like this. Now, this would be the non-relativistic motion on this surface. Starting a particle at the origin and letting it go according to this Lagrangian proposal is that the action that you would calculate um, would give you the complexity. The action and the length are related, uh, but uh, they're really they're proportional to each other. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay, now, um, here's what I know and here are my constraints. I expect the complexity to increase with time proportional to the number of qubits. And if the time that we're thinking about is the clock time of the computer or equivalently the Rindler time of a black hole, then I basically expect the, uh, the complexity to grow as k the number of qubits times time. That would be it, k times time. It's counting the number of gates, if you like, in a in a parallel circuit like this, per unit time. Number of gates per unit time uh, grows with the number of qubits. And that would say that you would better have the action growing linearly with, or be proportional to k. Next statement, let me imagine now a motion starting at the center and moving away from the center. No angular motion, just radial motion. Uh, I want the magnet, the actual value of the Lagrangian, to equal k. Why? Because that's the rate of change of complexity. Or well, that's the rate of change of action. We want the, if, if action is equal to complexity, then we want the motion to be such that the Lagrangian, the numerical value of the Lagrangian is just k. That's the rate of change of complexity. And that says that r dot is equal to 1. In other words, that the r that appears here is just the length of time as we move away from, uh, from the, or the clock time. But that says something in addition. It also says that distances along here grow exponentially with time. And it says that r, says that um, distances grow exponentially with time, which would say that the complexity grows exponentially with time. 
And that would be the, uh, the famous Yapanov exponent. In fact, the Yapanov exponent would come out to be 1. And that's the right value that we're interested in uh, for black holes. OK, that was the logic. But, uh, but then I did a, another little calculation to verify that this actually makes sense, but I think I'll leave it out. And just leave it out. Any questions? Right, now I want to propose another, again, these are conjectures, unproved. I want to argue that the average complexity, here we have this complexity space. There's a complexity space, which really means SU2 to the n, SU2 to the n, that um, that complexity space is negatively curved, expecting that it's negatively curved. Um, and I want to ask, what is the volume of this space of operators which have complexity C? Right, where am I going? I want to argue that the complexity, which is a feature of this A system, this auxiliary system, is actually the entropy of the A system. That's the logarithm of the volume of, um, of a region on the space. So here's what we would like to argue, that either the number of states or the volume, we call it in, number of states, by which I mean basically the volume, that the volume associated with a, with a complexity C grows exponentially with C. That's like saying, well, if we take the logarithm of this, it says that the, that the complexity is the log of the volume of a region, and that's the analog of entropy being the logarithm of volume of phase space. So, that's the goal, to try to see, is there any reason to think that the number of operators with a given complexity grows in this simple way? Um, I have not been able to prove it, but I've never proved anything in my life. <laughs> I think the main difference between me and other people is I admit that I can't prove things. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Actually, I can prove it. What you have to do whenever you prove something is you first have to make a sufficient number of definitions so that you know you can prove what you're trying to prove. And then after having made enough definitions and restricting it enough, then you prove it. Okay, I can do that with this. <laughs> I'm not going to. Because it's fake. OK. So let me start with the random, sort of the random circuit model. And see for the random circuit model whether we can get a handle of this at all. Random circuit model, I'm going to take a very simple version of the random circuit model, but it, in fact it works for, I mean, instead of using the parallel circuit model where everybody gets to interact in each time step, I'm just going to assume one gate at a time. The whole thing works for the parallel, but it's, it's easier for this. So the motion is a gate, 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 a gate. A gate, a gate so forth. Uh, U is equal to Gn, Gn minus 1, G1, and that's it. That's, and that, uh, where these gates are chosen in some way. And I want to choose them randomly. Okay? All right. Choosing the gates randomly, and starting at a point, defines a tree. It defines a tree. You start over here. And let's suppose, you, let's, uh, let's specify, let's suppose that each gate can be one of little m kinds. Um, I don't know, a CMOT gate, and a something other gate, and a Hadamard gate, and a this gate, and a that gate, um, m of them. Enough to, uh, 
universal. It will have to be universal. Okay? Okay. It doesn't matter what it is. On the other hand, the gate that you choose, you also have to choose a pair of qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay? You also have to pay, choose a pair of qubits. So in each set, each step, you have to choose a pair of qubits. So that means you get a decision at each point. And the decision is to pick one of n times one of n m times n times n minus one over two uh, possibilities. Okay. We'll just call this n times n squared. All right. So when you start out here, you move in any one of uh, n times n squared long arrows. And when you get to the next one, right, so we start out. Let's just say two directions. We go there, or we can go there. In the next step, we can go here, or we can go here. And this one can go here and go here, and so forth and so on. And in this little model of uh, what, um, what the complexity space looks like, it looks like a tree. It looks like a decision tree, like this. But a decision tree, what is it, what is it, what's the name of the number of branches that happen in a, in a, in a tree? A uh, branch comes in and splits into, I don't know. The number of bricks is minus one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it has a name. It has a name. Uh, let's call it the order of the, uh, I'm not sure what it's called. Yeah. Here the order is two. Okay. We're interested in trees of very high order. Um, of order n times n squared, the number of cubits squared, and of course this is a very high dimensional tree. <coughs> Let's see if the first thing you can say, incidentally, the first thing you can say, if you're anywhere on this tree and you decide to make another step, with extremely like, high likelihood you will go out along the tree. And the probability that you'll come back in is small, very small. And that's the origin of this idea that there's a second law of complexity in these, uh, in these situations. But let's see if we can calculate what the number of operators, the number of endpoints, the number of possible different endpoints, is as a function of the length of the uh, trajectory, as a function of the complexity itself. Um, well, the number of paths, the number of paths of length little n will be n times n squared, just the number of decisions, raised to the nth power. That's the number of possible paths uh, of length n. Now, sometimes different paths can wind up at the same point. This is a very unlikely possibility for a high dimensional tree. A high dimensional tree will stop branching and eventually, eventually you will simply run out of new possibilities. You'll come to the, uh, to, you know, you'll fill, you'll wind up filling this whole thing and there will have to be collisions, but at least for a long period of time, I mean we can probably prove that there's no collisions, for a long period of time. And so each path describes a different um, an, a different operator at the end. With this assumption, you can argue that the number of operators with of path length n is m squared, m n squared to the power n. Is that clear? It's just the number of paths and number of operators are the same thing, which we can also write as e to the n uh, log, log log n, n squared. This is a coefficient up here. The n here, assuming there are no collisions, the n here is the complexity. It's the minimum number of steps that it gets to a certain unitary, a certain unitary operator. So we can write then that this is the complexity of uh, a particular unitary along here, and that the number of 
This is not the number of qubits. Oops. Let's go for volume. The volume. That the volume associated with a complexity C is of order exponential. I'm just logarithmic factor here. I don't understand this logarithmic factor. I have a suspicion it's not there when you do things right, but <coughs> it's a weak dependence on the number of qubits. Uh, but in any case, the logarithm of the volume, apart from a numerical constant, which appears to be able to depend weakly on n, on the number of qubits, is equal to the, um, the complexity. That's the kind of relationship that uh, governs the relation between entropy and the volume of phase space. So the, the, uh, the picture then is that as far as the auxiliary system goes, we were thinking about an ensemble, remember what we were thinking about? Or, Start out with a whole bunch of particles moving in different directions, corresponding to the ensemble of different Hamiltonians. It could be SYK. These would be different Hamiltonians uh, associated with SYK. This uh, cloud of stuff moves out, and as it moves out, with overwhelming probability, it will move out in complexity. It will move out in complexity for the simple reason. That, uh, that the volume associated with the given complexity grows exponentially, and wherever you are, with overwhelming likelihood, you're likely to move out in complexity. So that's the idea of a second law. I have no idea why this isn't part of the culture in this uh, complexity business. It should be. OK, so any questions about that? Oh, um, if you do state complexity instead of unitary complexity, here is one more piece of information. The maximal state complexity for n qubits is 2 to the n. And then there's a logarithm. I think it's a log. I'll tell you what this is, log epsilon. In order to define complexity, strictly speaking, you really have to break up this space into little epsilon volumes. And really, you should ask the question, how many gates, or how, how, much, how many gates does it take to hit one of these epsilon volumes here? Epsilon is the rate, is a little radius of a little ball here. There is a there is a dependence in the complexity on the size of a little of, of, on the coarse graining of the space. It's, what's the name of the theorem? Um, uh, Kitayev-Solovey theorem. Solovey theorem. Yeah. yeah. What well, the Kitayev-Solovey theorem says is that the complexity maximum complexity is two to the n times a power of the log of epsilon. And I don't know that the power is known. I think it's not known. Yeah, I think the last time we checked, it was like 2, I think. The 2 is the upper bound. Upper bound, yeah, 2 exactly. is the upper bound. Yeah, but whether it's actually 1 or whether something Whether it's actually else, 1, I think, is not known. Yeah. But yeah, let's, let's use 2. <laughs> <laughs> right, it would, it would be pretty if it were 1. OK, so I write yeah. log epsilon here. Yeah, one would say that the, the shortcuts are very rare, basically, yeah. right? Yeah, so, so this tree structure is a quite yeah, good approximation right. until pretty yeah, late times. That's right. So do you have a minus sign somewhere? Sorry. Uh, where? Because epsilon gets large. Uh, oh, yeah, that's... Yes, that's, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, now, take the space of all states, of all normalized states, Cpn to the something, Cp2 to the n minus 1, some, some, basically a sphere, and divide it into epsilon balls, and ask how many epsilon balls. You calculate the volume of the sphere, you calculate the volume of an epsilon ball, and you divide, and you find, we can call that the number of states, the number of states, 
uh, if you do that calculation, is e to the 2 to the n. Don't you use a different letter? Yes, I know the second. Volume, volume. Yeah, good. Volume in units of epsilon spheres. So, uh, this is the max, this is the volume of the whole thing, this is the maximum complexity. This does not prove that the number of states with a given complexity is the logarithm of volume, but it does prove it for the maximal, uh, for the maximal. So, I think there's reasonable evidence at least that the, that the number of things with a given complexity grows exponentially and uh, grows quick enough that, uh, that grows exponentially. And that's the basis for this second law idea. All right, so then the picture is you have this auxiliary system where complexity is entropy. If you now start an ensemble near the origin here and let it go, it will start filling up regions, the same way that a gas of particles, which was oriented near the center here, would, uh, would grow. Initial velocities being related to the, um, to the Hamiltonians that you're averaging over. And eventually, you'll reach maximal complexity. The growth of the complexity, or the growth well, analogous to the growth of entropy, will stop. That's called reaching equilibrium. And you expect to get exactly the kind of graph that we started this whole class with, a graph of increasing complexity, analogous to increasing um, entropy, reach equilibrium. And a very, uh, how long does that take? That takes a time of order e to the n. That's the number of degrees of freedom. And then in a doubly exponential time, uh, well, if we were talking, in talking about an ensemble, I think this is what happens. In talking about an individual phase point moving in here, from time to time, they will uh, fluctuate back. And those back and forth fluctuations are what we call, in black hole physics, a white hole making a transition to a black hole. Decreasing complexity, increasing complexity. So that's what the meaning, if you like, of the bottom half of this diagram is. If you wait long enough, you'll see this, the whole thing. That's, uh, that I think is this. Okay. Um, Can I ask a question? Sorry. Yeah. When, when you talk about this uh, C max 2 to the end of black epsilon, is it is it a direct consequence? I is mean, it, is it what? Direct consequence of Solovey Kitaya? Because uh, I, may, maybe I'm wrong, but I had the impression that that theorem just gives you the epsilon dependence, but you yeah, somehow yeah. need to argue that 2 to the end is yeah, a Yeah, that's a count, There's a counting argument that uh, they'll give you 2 to the end, and I don't remember what it is, but. Um, I, uh, but you don't expect that there. I mean, I, I would if I'm a bit too, too uh, careful. I might say that there are specific unitaries which have particularly large uh, gate complexity, much more than two to the n. I mean, it, 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 it. there might be some uh, some random, very very bad unitary somewhere that is specifically hard to construct. Is it is it possible to think that such such things exist? I don't know. Um, I've been assuming all along that this was obvious, but uh, um, uh, but I've forgotten why. You didn't you didn't raise the question about four to the end for the unitaries. The same okay, question. Could have same it. question. Yeah. yeah. Um, let, let's come back to it. I don't have I don't have a quick answer. I think it is known. Everybody I have ever asked, what's the maximum complexity? It's always either 2 to the n or 4 to the n, depending on unitaries or states. But we, it, it's certainly worth coming back to. Um, my head is just not on it now, but I think there's a good argument, easy argument. It's a counting argument. Um, but, OK, well. All right, let's, uh, let's, if you're still up for it, we can talk about it a little more.
Oh, we can go home. I want to talk about this idea of uh, complexity as being a resource, or more specifically, the opposite of complexity being a resource. A resource for what? Well, first we could ask, what is the opposite of entropy, and what is it a resource for? The opposite of entropy is minus entropy, but uh, you don't usually define minus entropy. You define the difference between the maximum entropy, the equilibrium entropy, and the entropy you have, and that tells you how much more entropy you have. Now, you usually use free energy, okay? but free energy contains a minus entropy in it. There's an energy term, uh, and then minus an entropy. So there's a word for the maximum entropy minus the entropy. It's called the net entropy. It was invented by Schrodinger in his little book on life. And he says neg entropy is very important to have if you want to make structure. So neg entropy is a resource. The meaning of that is if a system is in equilibrium, not much happens and you can't do much with it. If a system is far from equilibrium, a lot can happen on the way to equilibrium. And so neg entropy is a resource for things happening for, to do work. You no, know, I mean work is a particular example. Keep things up. Right. So the question is, what meaning is there to make complexity or uncomplexity? Which just define it. Exactly the same thing. The maximum complexity of the system minus the actual complexity of the system. Um, I think I'll go through some of this another time, but let me just tell you what the geometric meaning of it is. The geometric meaning of now back to black holes. Back to black holes. Speculating that this is a resource. And in fact, it may be a resource for many different kinds of things. In computational theory, I think it might be a resource for doing computations. If your computer, here's the, here's the idea. If you have a computer, a quantum computer, and you run it for a very long period of time, the state will become maximally complex. Okay. What can you do with a computer which has reached some state of maximal complexity? Well, in many respects, a state of maximal complexity is very similar to a, a mixed state of maximal, um, maximally mixed state. It's not. A state, a state of maximal complexity is a pure state, right. but, um, but with respect to any kind of local measurements, any kind of reasonable measurements, except the measurements of insanely complex things, the maximally mixed state and the maximally complex state are the same, or very similar. So what could you do with a computer that has reached um, maximal uh, complexity? Now what I'm not going to allow you to do is do measurements. Well, a measurement, a single measurement, could uh, bring uh, could uh, bring it back to a simple state again. Right? Not going to lie, though. I don't know what you can do with it by continuing to run the computer without without um, without entangling it with the environment, so to speak, right? bringing it or effectively bringing it in the environment. Okay, what can you do with it? The answer is nothing. There's nothing. At least I don't think there's anything right. interesting. To do anything interesting, you need to undo this complexity. Without measurement to do un to undo this complexity, you need to run it for exponential yeah. amount of time. Right. So, so right, right. So the maximally mixed state, nothing will do in a short time. Yeah. The maximally mixed state, nothing will help. It's just too random. To any any unitary conjugate the density matrix by any unitary operator, and you just get back the same thing. So nothing, to you do, nothing you do to it changes it. Right. All right. Pretty much the same thing about the maximally complex state. What happens with maximally complex states is anything you do to it will just give you back another maximally complex state, which will, again, look like the maximally mixed state. Yeah. So you're, I think you're out of luck, computationally speaking, if your computer has run to the ground with, uh, with, um, and become maximally complex. Uh, let me not come to black holes. I'll come to black holes another time. 
but let's continue along this thought. Okay. But now there's a curious fact. The maximal complexity of a system of n qubits is of order 2 to the n. But the logarithm is not important here. If I add one qubit to the system, the maximal complexity becomes 2n plus 1, which is twice 2 to the n. So by adding a single qubit to a computer which has run itself completely into the ground, I find myself a uncomplexity, this is uncomplexity, I bind myself an uncomplexity which is big as the original complexity, the original maximal complexity of the system. That suggests that you can do computations with just one qubit plus a maximally complex state that you can do computations. Now, uh, we'll, we can talk about this another, another time. Yes, the answer is yes. You can do computations. You can do powerful computations with a maximally complex state plus one extra qubit. And uh, I want to come back to this. But for now, yes, I will come to black holes. What is the meaning of um, the uncomplexity of a state from the point of view of black holes? Alice has her black hole. The black hole is run for a very long time. She may not even know how long, she doesn't even know how long it's run. She encounters a black hole and she wants to know the following question. Depending on when she jumps in, she may jump in right then, or she may delay a while, she may delay a longer while. What's the total available amount of space-time that she can experience? I don't mean with one jump, she only gets a certain amount of space-time. But what's the total number of possible places she can visit behind the horizon of the black hole? I'm going to make one assumption. I'm going to make the assumption that when the black hole has reached maximal complexity, the, um, the space is no longer expanding, and let's say she hits a lot of firewall. This is, this is something. That's, that's where firewalls occur, when you reach maximal complexity. Well, that assumption is a nice picture of what the uncomplexity means. You, you all know what it is, but nevertheless, I'm saying it for the camera. Uh, right. and, um, okay, so what is the picture that goes with uncomplexity? What is the... Um, So we start, let's take a one-sided black hole. Oh, Lord. One-sided black hole, one-sided ABS black hole. This is R equals zero. This is R equals infinity. And the black hole may have been created by a shell, but I don't care about that right now. And here's the horizon. Okay, there's the horizon. Here's Alice right at this time over here. And she can jump in over here. She can wait a while and jump in. She can wait a while and jump in. But there's a limit. If she waits too long, she hits this place where the complexity has reached its maximum. And then we don't really know what happens, but let's assume that whatever happens up here is uh, dangerous for Alice. Uh, the, the geometry is simply not evolving classically up here. All right, so let's first think about Alice's complexity, or the, the complexity of the black hole at T Alice over here. And that's given by, let's say, the action of the Wheeler-DeWitt patch, which looks like this. That's the wheel of the wind patch. This is Alice's anchoring time, forward light cone, backward light cone. Now the portion of the action that's in this outer region here, that is, it's infinite because of the infinity of the volume near the boundary here, but it's also time independent. So I'm gonna to get that and concentrate on the portion of the action behind the horizon, and that's really the part of the action that we think of as belonging to the horizon degrees of freedom, the stuff that behind the horizon is yeah. And therefore, the 
the complexity of Alice's black hole with horizon degrees of freedom is proportional to the action of this region, which is, by the time you finish and you work it out, uh, for a variety of different kinds of black holes, will be proportional to the space-time volume behind the horizon. Yeah. On the other hand, what is the maximum complexity? The maximum complexity is to wait until you reach this time out here, which is exponential, and then consider the same diagram, which will include this region here. That's the maximal complexity. And the uncomplexity is simply the difference between these two. So the uncomplexity is simply the volume of space-time here. Well, that's exactly the amount of space-time that Alice can visit from this point over here. So if you like to think that space-time is a resource, what, what can Alice experience? Then we would say that the uncomplexity is, the, um, is Alice's space-time resource that, behind the horizon that she can experience. We can talk another time, next time or whenever, about uncomplexity and to what extent it's really a resource for doing computations. Good. There are some good problems here. I wish somebody would uh, solve all of them for me. I'll pay you to solve them. But not a lot. <laughs> Google. I don't think that Google should pay people to solve problems for me. How much, how much do you want to work on with these problems? Uh, not that much, eh? Not like, that much. Just, yeah, like, we do it for PhD salary, so, like, we just need to enough to... Do you think I would think get them solved faster if I got you $200,000 a year? Would that speed oh, up? Oh, no, I doubt no. that. No, I don't think no. science would, yeah, probably not. Okay, then I, I won't try to get you $200,000 Yeah, year. probably. But if you be, advertise yeah. it, more people will get into this field, so probably, eventually, it will be faster. Eventually. Now, like, I know a lot of talented yeah. people. I think you are right. Go yeah. to other fields like computer science. They want to be something. Is that still going on? <laughs> 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 